We'll move on now to uh, Dr. Pitchler. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Matt, for inviting me to speak here today. It's always a great pleasure. Um, and I'm so glad to be here. And uh, I hope I can you see my slides okay? I hope you can. That looks good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a totally different topic today. I'm going to talk about coffee and the kidney. And so you might, yeah, I'm a liver kidney guy. Why would I talk about coffee and the kidney? Well, I think there is historical perspective to this. Um, and this is Vienna, my hometown of Vienna, depicted in 1683. And what was happening is the Ottoman Empire was, was marching through Europe and Vienna was under siege. There was all these Turkish troops surrounding Vienna. They were running out of food and water. They were getting, getting rel relatively desperate, intermittent fasting and things. Um, uh, lucky to the Viennese, the Polish King Sobieski came along with his troops and bailed them out. And the Turks were not prepared for that. So they left in a hurry and left behind their tents. And in their tents were bags of coffee. Coffee was really sort of a culture in, in Turkey at the time, but not in Western Europe. And so the story goes that this guy uh, uh, by the name of Kosciuszki was rewarded for some of the services of interpreting during that siege by getting 30 bags of coffee. And he decided that he was going to open the first coffee shop in Vienna in 1683. Here's Count Steinberg who gets his cup of coffee. Uh, the Viennese invented a couple of things around that time. They invented adding milk to coffee. You know, the Turks were the real men that drank black coffee. The Viennese were sissies. And so they added milk to the coffee. Anyhow, so coffee culture in Vienna has a long tradition. And um, so um, if you go to a Viennese coffee house, you get your cup of coffee, but you also get a glass of water with it. Why would that be? Well, I was always taught that, you know, you get that glass of water because coffee is a diuretic. So the question that I have for you and that I'm gonna to try to answer with this talk is, is coffee or does coffee act as a diuretic? And I have um, some questions for you here. So question number one, and maybe you can sort of respond to it in the, in the chat and Matt, maybe you can, can let me know what the answers are. So question number one, what do my esteemed colleagues think? A, the diuretic, of, the diuretic effect of coffee is a myth. Come on, this is, you know, nothing. B, coffee only causes water diuresis or C, coffee causes uh, naturesis. So what do people think? Can you just maybe sort of let me know, A, B or C? It's probably a myth. Um, Everyone is saying C so far. Naturesis, because if you go to a coffee shop in Seattle, you don't get a glass of water. This is must be a Viennese thing. So people are thinking yeah. things causes neat nature races. Okay. We have one vote from Dr. Struthers for A. It's a myth. It's a myth. A couple more, a couple more votes for A. <laughs> okay. So the Viennese are out to lunch. Let me ask you another question. The diuretic effect of coffee, if it's not a myth, is mediated by inhibition of ADH causing acrolysis A, B, blockade of ENAC, or C, blockade of the thiazide sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter. What do people think here? Not as many brave souls answering this one, Raymond, uh, but a couple votes for C. Okay, so it may act as a thiazide like diuretic. All right, maybe people are onto something. Okay, so, um, so let's go through some of the data. So this is an old study, more than 30 years old. The majority of these studies that I'm gonna show you are relatively small, but that's the data I have to work with. So this is a study from Switzerland, a single blind randomized crossover study. They took male volunteers in their twenties, only eight of them. The important thing about this study, and remember this, is that they were off all coffee, tea, uh, chocolate, and hot chocolate for a week. Okay, so that's important for this. And then they got 300 milliliters of instant coffee, the famous Mocafino brand, 
which is I hear quite tasty, with 250 milligrams of caffeine versus decaf instant coffee. So, so instant coffee, 300 milliliters, 250 milligrams of caffeine after having been off coffee for a week. And what did they find? Um, they find, found an increase in urine volume. So um, if you look here, uh, you can see the time where they're drinking the coffee and you can see in the first hour, there's a statistically significant increase in urine volume in the dark bars. Those are the ones that got caffeine compared to placebo. Uh, no significant differences, although a trend at two hours and no differences at three hours. All right, so we have now evidence that it increases urine volume. Now, they also looked at urinary sodium and potassium excretion. And what you can see is that um, here, drinking coffee again, first, second, and third hour after drinking 250 milligrams of coffee, they get a significant increase in natural rhesus. And within the first hour, there's also uh, an increase in potassium excretion, which subsequently subsides. So interestingly, there actually is a naturetic effect um, that occurs after coffee ingestion. Um, so they also measured urine osmolality and the urine osmolar excretion sort of increased, not surprisingly, you can see an increase in urine osmolar excretion with caffeine treated um, uh, volunteers as compared to the volunteers who got the decaf coffee. Um, what I like about the study is they measured all kinds of things, um, including vitals. So what you can also see, uh, and this is a topic for another day, um, that coffee increases blood pressure. You can see that within about an hour or so, you have a significant increase in blood pressure, which remains um, elevated for a while, both systolic and diastolic blood pressure, no significant um, effect on heart rate. So that's something that's well known and well established as well. It's probably mediated through release of epinephrine. They measured actually epinephrine levels in these uh, patients. And it, uh, what they saw was that there was a significant increase in epinephrine levels after about an hour, an hour and a half or so um, that probably fueled that increase in blood pressure. Um, one of the questions they asked is this an um, atrial natriuretic peptide effect, right? That's something I didn't put in the questions, but uh, at the time it was thought maybe this is atrial natriuretic peptide, no differences in atrial natriuretic peptide. So it turns out that natriuretic effect is not mediated uh, through atrial natriuretic peptide. Um, and, oops, uh, and then they also looked at all kinds of other hormonal systems, including uh, the renin angiotensin system, uh, plasma renin levels, aldosterone levels, vasopressin levels, ADH, and serum osmolality, and there was no differences in any of those. So in summary, uh, what these authors showed is that caffeine increases urine volume, uh, and as well as urine sodium and potassium excretion. The urine potassium excretion increase was more short-lived than the sodium excretion. Caffeine increases epinephrine levels and blood pressures, but there was no effect on atrial natriuretic peptide, no effect on ADH, and no effect on the renin angiotensin system. So um, this is another study that looked at different doses of caffeine, sort of a dose finding study, so to speak. Um, and what they did here is it was a single blind crossover study. They took 10 healthy adults, um, eight male, two female, also in their 20s who were relatively slim. Um, and they had a shorter duration of being free of coffee, tea, uh, cocoa, so no methylxanthines for about 24 hours in the study, so it should have a shorter, so to speak, sobriety. Um, they had an overnight fast, and then they received a stingy, I would say, stingy standard breakfast. They got one slice of toast with butter and jam, and then they either got only 200 milliliters of water, 200 milliliters of instant coffee with three milligrams per kilogram of body weight of caffeine, and 200 milliliters of instant coffee with six milligrams per kilogram uh, of caffeine per, per kilogram body weight. Urine was collected at 60, 120, and uh, 180 minutes. Um, so here's what they found. They found only an increase in urine volume in the highest caffeine group. So only in uh, patients who got six milligrams per kilogram that they found an increase in urine volume. So that's about, you know, for 70 kilogram uh, uh, patient, about 420 milligrams of caffeine. 
uh, but no difference uh, in the three milligram per kilogram group. That was no different to, to water, 200 milligrams of stingy water alone. Um, and then, then not surprisingly, the urine uh, osmotic excretion in the higher dose group at six milligrams per kilogram of caffeine was increased as well. Um, they looked at urine sodium uh, excretion. Um, the, the six milligram uh, per kilogram caffeine group is in gray compared to the water group. You can see that both at the 60 minute uh, time frame, the first hour and the third hour, there was a statistical different difference between the urine sodium excretion in the second hour. It was actually not different. So evidence to support again that that caffeine causes um, at higher doses a an increase in urine volume and an increase in urine sodium excretion. Maybe part of the difference is is the shorter amount of uh, of time that these patients were off methyl sensenes. So summary for the second study is only higher doses of caffeine. So in the neighborhood of six milligrams per kilogram, maybe like. 420 milligrams for a 70 kilogram person have a diuretic effect and naturesis does occur. Um, there is a lot of studies that, that, that have looked at the, the diuretic effect of caffeine and there's a ton of negative studies. So this table here shows you in red all the negative studies that have not shown a diuretic effect of caffeine. And the green studies are studies where there was a diuretic effect. And you can see that the, the, the doses used in the heart and in the successful or in the positive studies were higher on average. And then there was also differences in how long uh, the patients were off coffee or methyl So it seems like overall higher doses seem to work um, better than lower doses. So just to put this into content of what people actually drink, um, here in Seattle, you don't got the, get the Viennese coffee with the glass of water. So uh, in terms of thinking about people who drink drip coffee, um, so if you look at blonde roast um, that has the highest caffeine content, um, so a venti uh, blonde roast has 475 milligrams of caffeine. So that's something that probably would make you pee more. But if you only get a short, a tall, or maybe a grande, you may not actually have a diuretic effect. And those of you who say, you know, I don't drink drip coffee, that's for sissies. I drink espresso. The caffeine ca content of espresso is actually less. So I know Stuart is a big Americano fan. Americano is actually looking relatively good here at the venti. Um, but if you drink cafe latte, right? Only one shot in a short and tall, that's 75 milligrams or 150 milligrams, two shots in a grande of venti, that's not gonna make you pee more. So if you pee more after drinking a venti latte, it's probably all the milk that you drank, but not the caffeine or the fluid that you drank. Okay, um, so what about chronic caffeine administration? So in some of these earlier studies, I've shown you that they were off methylxanthines for you know, a week or a few days. What if you chronically consume caffeine like some of us do? So this is a prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study in roughly 60 male athletes who were uh, in their teens to 30s, and they were randomized to three different caffeine doses. And what they did in this study is they had sort of a run-in or what they called an equilibration phase. So the, for the first six days, everybody in that study got three milligrams per kilogram of caffeine. And then they were randomized to no caffeine and terrible headaches. I don't know, actually, three milligrams uh, per kilogram of caffeine or six milligrams per kilogram of caffeine. Um, and um, they, they went as far as even measuring caffeine levels. And what you can see here is that in the run-in phase, everybody was, was taking their caffeine. They had very similar levels because they were all getting three milligrams per kilogram. And then uh, in the real study period, um, which was day seven to 12, um, they had a dose-dependent increase in caffeine levels, suggesting that the, their uh, patients actually complied, complied with the caffeine intake. And this is a very, very busy table. They collected a ton of data, but what I can tell you is there was no difference in the urine volume between the groups. There was no difference in the urine specific gravities. There was no difference in the urine osmolalities. There was no difference in the urine creatinine excretion. And there was no difference in the urine sodium excretion. Um, there was no difference in hematocrit, plasma proteins, 
serum osmolality, serum sodium, and serum potassium levels. So this was a study that was actually, so to speak, negative in terms of diuretic or natriuretic effect. There was no difference, and this was much larger than the other study, no difference between the three groups. And the, the conclusion was that chronic caffeine consumption does not cause diuresis or naturesis. okay? So what we have learned so far is that in order to have a diuretic or naturetic effect, you need a larger dose of caffeine. So you need in the neighborhood of greater than three or 400 milligrams of caffeine. So if you do the, the Starbucks blonde, it's a venti. Uh, and caffeine acts as a diuretic in individuals who have been deprived of caffeine for several days. And the actions of caffeine are diminished in individuals who are regularly consumed, uh, consume coffee or tea. So I, I can't tell you that, you know, you're regularly drinking small amounts of caffeine and then a bigger amount where you, you may have a little bit of a diuretic effect. Um, here is a meta-analysis of the diuretic of effect of caffeine where you can see a huge uh, difference in, uh, in, in the diuretic um, uh, properties, probably depending on doses that were used, probably uh, depending on uh, also how long people have been off methyl zinc scenes. But in, in general, um, there is a favor of caffeine being a diuretic. All right, so now, since we are nephrologists, we want to know where in the nephron is coffee, is coffee actually acting? What, what are the mechanisms? So um, let's go back to, to basics. This is the chemical structure of caffeine. This is what it looks like. So what does caffeine do pharmacologically? And what the first thing I remembered uh, thinking about this was that it inhibits phosphodiesterase, okay? So by doing that, it actually increases cyclic AMP, um, which actually can cause lipolysis in adipose tissue. Uh, so that's why a lot of these weight, form, weight loss formulas add caffeine to it. But what's important to know is that caffeine is a really weak inhibitor of phosphodiesterase. So the required concentrations to inhibit phosphodiesterase are in the neighborhood of 1,000 micromoles per liter, whereas if you drink sort of coffee, you get maybe to 10 to 50. So you're far off from really uh, causing a significant inhibition of phosphodiesterase. So that's probably not the mechanism. Um, but it seems to have to do with adenosine. So if you look at the chemical structure of caffeine, to the, to the untrained eye, it looks relatively similar to adenosine. And what actually has been shown is that caffeine can bind to the adenosine receptor. Um, and by doing that, um, it, it, it inhibits adenosine from being able to bind to the receptor. So caffeine does not actually activate the receptor, but it's, a, it's a, essentially, essentially a receptor uh, antagonist on the receptor level, okay? And by doing that, it actually has some of the CNS uh, effect. So what we know is that if we get tired, uh, adenosine accumulates in our bodies uh, and, and makes us tired, so we wanna go to sleep. So if you then drink caffeine, right? Adenosine can't bind to the receptor, so you actually have CNS stimulation. That's why we wake up. Hopefully you had some coffee before this talk. Um, and it causes a release of norepinephrine, which, which, uh, which is a central process dopamine, and some other neurotransmitters that have activating functions. So those are some of the positive effects of coffee. Now, if you actually want to prove that adenosine is a mediator here, um, what better than to do than to actually to study this in receptor knockout mice? So here are mice, um, and these researchers here took two, took, two, took two different mice. They took a wild-type mouse and adenosine uh, A1 receptor knockout mouse, and they uh, fed these mice caffeine or theophylline, and then they did all kinds of measurements. And by the way, theophylline seems to be working very, very similar to caffeine here. And what they found was that caffeine-mediated diuresis and naturesis is mediated through this receptor. So if you look here on, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that in the wild-type uh, mice here, there was a significant increase in urine volume uh, in the black bar here, who were treated with caffeine compared to a vehicle, uh, there was no effect in the knockout mice. And similarly, when they looked at urine sodium excretion, that urine sodium excretion was much higher in the wild types compared to the knockouts, proving, proving that the mechanism, at least in mice, is through the adenosine E1 receptor. 
Um, hold on. Um, and and it's very similar results with theophylline. So theophylline here in the same mice, again, wild type mice, increasing urine volume uh, with theophylline and here on the right-hand side uh, with wild-type mice, an increase uh, in urine sodium excretion with theophylline, no, uh, no effect in the knockout mice, again, suggesting that this is mediated through the same adenosine E1 receptor. Um, interestingly, the increases in blood pressure were independent of that E1 receptor, right? Because one of the thoughts I had early on, well, maybe this is a pressure naturesis thing, right? Jacks up the blood pressure, you have pressure naturesis. So, both wild type and knockout mice had similar increases in blood pressure in response to both theophylline and, and, uh, and caffeine, uh, and that was not mediated through the type 1 receptor. Um, here, is, here is an older paper. There's no sort of newer good reviews on sort of the effects on the nephron, but this is a paper looking at effects of adenosine on the kidney. I think one thing that that is a topic for another day is the hepatorenal reflex that seems to be mediated through adenosine. We can talk about that in a liver kidney talk, but thinking about it here in terms of nephron. So here, uh, afferent arterial. So adenosine constricts the afferent arterial and actually lowers GFR. You're thinking about it, adenosine is higher when we sleep, sort of makes sense, right? Adenosine increases sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule. Uh, right? So, and then if you would give, could give caffeine, it would antagonize that, right? So with caffeine, you would increase actually uh, uh, sodium excretion in the proximal tubule. Um, in the medulla, uh, adenosine causes middle, medullary vasodilatation. So caffeine would actually cause medullary vasoconstriction by, by being as a receptor antagonist. Um, in the thick ascending loop, um, adenosine inhibits sodium reabsorption meaning that, um, that caffeine would uh, increase uh, sodium reabsorption um, and then sort of looking net along the entire nephron, the net effect of adenosine is that it increases sodium reabsorption. So therefore caffeine would decrease uh, sodium reabsorption and cause naturesis. Um, up to about a few years ago, is it was thought that the main uh, transporters that are affected by adenosine are the NHE3, the sodium phosphorus co-transporter, and interestingly, SGLT, although I have found no evidence that glucosuria is one of the side effects um, of caffeine. So those are the receptors that have been sort of thought to be um, um, affected. Um, there's one more study that I'm going to bore you with. This is doll, the, the caffeine intake in doll salt-sensitive rats. So what they did here is they took doll salt-sensitive rats. Those are rats that become hypertensive if you put them on a high-sodium diet, and they randomized them to a high-salt diet plus water or a high-salt diet with water with 0.1% caffeine. And then they watched them for 15 days. And what they found was that there was no effect on urine volume. What I should say is what's interesting is that the caffeine treated animals drank less in the first few days. I don't know if it was because of the bitter taste of the caffeine in the water. Maybe they didn't like it, but that was sort of an interesting thing. But there was a not huge, but statistically significant increase in urinary sodium excretion. And what's really interesting about this is the effect on the blood pressure on this. So let's look at the caffeine treated animals here in the dark circles. You can see that early on within the first day, the caffeine treated animals had actually higher blood pressures, but then subsequently, um, just because they're spilling more sodium, presumably the blood pressure sort of remains relatively stable. Whereas you can see a progressive rise in blood pressure in the uh, control treated animals. Um, and what they found in that study is that this is a Western blot analysis of ENAC. So alpha ENAC expression or alpha, alpha ENAC protein uh, was significantly decreased in this lysate of two balls um, in these rats. I have to say there's controversy about ENAC. There's other studies that have shown no effect on ENAC. But at least in dull salt sensitive rats, caffeine prevents hypertension by, uh, by reducing alpha ENAC expression and thereby increasing naturesis. So if caffeine is in fact a diuretic, should Nisha, Nayan, and David be using it? Because they're using all kinds of crazy diuretics all the time, including SGLT2 inhibitors in the hospital. 
All right, let's look at the study from the 70s. So this is a randomized controlled study in 18 patients with congestive heart failure who had been on, on a stable diuretic regimen of bumetanide four milligrams a day. And they were randomized to Bumex four milligrams plus 400 milligrams of theophylline, Bumex four milligrams or Bumex six milligrams. And what they found in the study is when we look at urinary sodium excretion in the dark bars, patients who got Bumex four plus theophylline had much higher urinary sodium excretion compared to Bumex-4 or Bumex-6. And uh, they found that urine volume here in these uh, hash uh, bars was significantly higher in Bumex plus theophylline compared to Bumex-4 or 6 milligrams. So definitely works as an adjunct to a loop diuretic. Okay, so in summary, um, I hope I've shown you that caffeine can be a diuretic if it's given at a high enough dose, think three to 400 milligrams at least, and if the person has not been on caffeine for several days. Can, caffeine can cause a naturesis, it's not only an aquaretic. Mechanism appears to be an adenosine antagonism and therefore sort of uh, the, the downstream effect uh, on different parts of the nephron. Uh, transporters that have been sort of implicated are NHE3, the sodium phos co-transporter, possibly SGLT, and a little controversy uh, on ENAC. All right, uh, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Obviously, one of the most famous Viennese coffee houses, Coffee, uh, Coffee Raimund. Thanks so much, Dr. Pitchler. Questions for Raymond? So Raymond, what do you tell your patients who are hypertensive about coffee and caffeine consumption? Do you tell them to reduce, to lower their blood pressure? Yeah, no, I don't tell them that, right? Because, you know, chronic caffeine use, I mean, while, while it may affect your blood pressure reading at the time, if you take a large dose, well, well, anyhow, so I think I'm going to answer that question actually because the data for that is really controversial, and um, and I could devote an entire lecture to answering this question. <laughs> Raymond, it's Leah. As a decaf coffee drinker, um, I'm just wondering: shouldn't the control group be decaf coffee versus regular coffee in case there are other things in coffee that have natriuretic effects that haven't, you know? rather yeah. than water versus coffee. <laughs> so. Exactly, yeah. So, and I think some of the studies, right? I mean, the, the first Nussberger at all that, that I showed you was decaf coffee. It was, oh, okay. so some of the studies did use decaf coffee. The majority of them used instant coffee, instant like real coffee or instant decaf, just because it was more predictable to them how much caffeine was going to be in there. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. You shouldn't just do water as a control. That's correct. Raymond, can I just ask you to Han? Um, so you know that you showed that the effects are usually pretty much gone by three, four hours after the coffee consumption. What is the clinical implication of all of this? Like, you know, and, and plus you showed the fact that if you drink it long term, um, it doesn't seem to have an effect. So does it have long term clinical? Like I, I was having palpitations when I saw your topic. Um, but does it have long-term clinical implications for all of this? Um, you know, probably in, in for hypertension, probably not. And you know, what 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 Wolfgang Winkelmann and others have shown that habitual ca caffeine intake is not, in, in for instance, in, in the nurses study, is, is not associated with long-term risk of hypertension, right? And in fact, there may actually be a protective effect in some studies, maybe because of the small natriuretic effect that you see. Um, so I, I, I don't see sort of a deleterious effect. I mean, there's, there's a brain, I mean, this is, you know, I think I would like to do one entire talk about, you know, caffeine and blood pressure. And then there is also, you know, so some data about CKD progression. There is data on, you know, cyst growth and polycystic kidney disease. It's very, very complicated, but I, I would say in general for, for the general audience, it's totally safe to drink coffee. And I don't think there's a lot of deleterious effects. And in fact, there's a number of studies that have been done in athletes because the question always comes up, do you get dehydrated and as a performing athlete, does it negatively affect your performance? And that has been shown not to be the case. Um, there's also a meta-analysis that showed that it depends on what you do. If you're physically active, there's much less of a diuretic effect 
than if you're sedentary, right? So there's level of activity is, is also one of the things. So I would say I don't see any deleterious effects. Thank you so much, Dr. Pitchfloor. Um, we will move on now to